Good evening and welcome. I'm Susan L., Vice President and Executive Director of the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Leading Edge Medicine 2021. This is the first in our Leading Edge Medicine series this year and also our first virtual Leading Edge Medicine ever. And that's a lot of firsts, all in our 25th year. Yes, you heard correctly. The foundation is celebrating 25 years of stewarding the generosity of our donors who, like so many of you, give to enrich lives, save lives, and transform healthcare. BJC Healthcare has seen remarkable growth during that time. Your philanthropy has enabled innovations and advancements in research and comparable learning opportunities for the next generation of caregivers, all of which informs exceptional care and treatments for our patients. Gifts to the foundation support research, education, and treatment for all areas of care at Barnes Jewish Hospital on the Washington University Medical Center campus and in every department at the medical school. Tonight's Leading Edge Medicine highlights the foundation's partnership with the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery. What better focus for February, which is Heart Month, than a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Division Chief Dr. Ralph J. Damiano, Jr. The Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine was founded more than 100 years ago. Today is recognized as the nation's preeminent program for training, research, and patient care in this highly specialized area of medicine. Before we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge the members of the Foundation Board of Directors present tonight. Thank you for all you do on behalf of the Foundation, our hospital, and our community. And now, to introduce Dr. Damiano, please join me in welcoming Dr. John Lynch, President of Barnes Jewish Hospital. John? Thank you, Susan. It is my pleasure to be with you tonight and to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Ralph Damiano. Before I do that officially, I want to add my thanks to everyone joining us tonight. Your partnership and philanthropy are so important to our hospital system. It is because of you that we can provide world-class patient care and treatments, conduct leading edge research, and train the next generation of physicians, surgeons, and nurses. Dr. Damiano is the Everett's Graham Professor of Surgery and Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the Washington University School of Medicine. He also co-chairs our Heart and Vascular Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital. He received his medical degree from Duke University and went on to complete his general surgery and cardiothoracic surgery training at Duke University Medical Center, working for Jim Cox, the founder of modern atrial fibrillation surgery. Under Dr. Damiano's leadership, the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery has grown as a national referral center for complex cardiothoracic conditions and has one of the most outstanding and oldest and respected training programs in the country. Now, Dr. Damiano has followed the typical pattern of discovery. He notices a problem, he goes back to the lab, he seeks results, and that pattern has led him to discover many, many innovations in cardiothoracic surgery. But there's also another pattern I wanna tell you about, and that's the phone call from Dr. Damiano. So he usually starts with John in that very deep baritone voice. I wanna thank you and recognize all the great things that the hospital has done for our program. And then I wait for the but. And then he goes on for the next 10 minutes and tells me all the things that we could be doing better. Now, I know that what he's really saying is, we want excellence for our program. And so Ralph, thank you for those phone calls and we're looking forward to your comments this evening. Good evening. Um, thank you, John, for those kind remarks. Um, thank you for tremendous leadership um, you've shown us at the hospital and your tireless support of the medical staff. I'd particularly like to thank you for always answering your phone, even when you knew the butt was going to greatly, um, greatly outweigh the thanks in most of my conversations with you. But thanks so much for your support. It's great to be here this evening at what's our first virtual uh, foundation event. I know we all miss being together, but I hope in um, the next uh, 20, 30 minutes in the comfort of your own home, I can tell you a little bit about the leading edge medicine in cardiothoracic surgery. And I'll be happy to answer questions 
at the end. I'll start with a brief summary of our division for those of you who aren't familiar with it and a little bit of our history. You know, in the division of CT surgery, we really have a three-part mission. Most importantly, we're all committed to providing high quality, world-class clin clinical care to our patients. But that's not really possible without the other um, parts of that, uh, of our mission. And that's in particularly performing basic and clinical research to advance our field and improve that care we can give patients and also to train and educate the next generation of CT surgeons. I'd like to start again um, and, and particularly acknowledge the foundation, which has provided critical support, allowing us to achieve excellence in each of the three pillars of our academic mission. Just a little bit of a note about our uh, present foundation endowment. It's over $23 million. And to be honest with you, that has allowed us to really uh, achieve a lot of what you're gonna um, hear about in the next 20 minutes. With the foundation, we've had, we have four endowed chairs. And to give you an idea, just in the last uh, year, over $600,000 of support came from this endowment to support our clinical and research mission and our faculty. And I hope to give you some, a little illustration of what that money has been put to very good use. Um, obviously, None of that would be possible without the generous donors and grateful patients and even our own faculty for their philanthropy and the foundation for making it all possible. So let's get on. We've also recently had a number of gifts to support the training of future physician scientists in our field. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge the Goldstein Family Foundation, Sandy and Maureen Saltz, Martha and Jim Dow, and Jim and Nick Kachukas, and, and Nick is pictured below. Probably a special shout out to Dr. Kachukas, who needs no introduction um, to this audience. But as you know, Dr. Kachukas was really a uh, premier clinical um, chief of our group at Jewish Hospital for many years. His group at Jewish left a large endowment at the foundation, which made possible for my own laboratory to get started and continually supports our young surgical investigators. And he recently made another gift supporting training of young physician scientists in our field. And I'd like to particularly thank Judy and Nick for that generous gift. A little bit about our division. We're actually the second oldest division of cardiothoracic surgery in the world. Uh, founded over 90 years ago by Everts Graham, who of his time was considered the premier academic surgeon, certainly of his generation in this country. There's some pictures below of Dr. Graham, but he really embodied what we call the triple th threat. Um, his clinical uh, prowess was um, remarkable. At one point, it was said he accounted for 40% himself of the clinical revenue at Barnes Hospital but he was also a great researcher. In the middle panel, you'll see a picture of him with Ernie Widner, who when he was a third year medical student worked with Dr. Graham and the two of them over the years really developed the causal link between smoking and lung cancer, which now we take for granted, but there it was very, very important and uh, major work. Dr. Graham also was a great teacher and you can see him teaching the residents um, in the, Far panel, and Dr. Graham um, trained many of the academic leaders around the country during his years as chairman of our department. Our division over the last 90 years has performed a number of firsts, including the first successful pneumonectomy, which is a removal of the lung, the first successful surgical treatment or any interventional treatment of atrial fibrillation, the most common arrhythmia in the world, and the first successful lung volume reduction. Over that time, we've had 13 past and current presidents of the AATS and STS, and those are the two largest societies of cardiothoracic surgery in the world, the AATS being the oldest. But we haven't rested on our past. We've continued to grow, and while I will admit I am very biased at the present time, I think we have the biggest and most productive faculty in our history, and I'll show you a little bit of that. Our team right now, which 
I definitely would love to acknowledge tonight, we have 25 clinical and research faculty at seven different clinical sites where we perform surgery. We have 55 support staff, 33 advanced practice nurses who help take care of our patients, five clinical and research nurses, and a group of 20 clinical and research fellows. It's quite a big group and they all do an excellent job. On our faculty now, we have past presidents of the STS, and this is our active faculty and our emeritus faculty. The STS, the AATS, International Society of Heart Lung Transplant, the International Society of Minimally Invasive Cardiothoracic Surgery, the Society of Clinical Surgery, and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, to name just a few. Two of our faculty I'd like to call out for some special shout outs, Dr. Moon, who's chief of cardiac surgery, is the current president of the AATS, again, the oldest society in cardiothoracic surgery. And Dr. Patterson, again, needing no introduction to this group, is editor of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, the largest circulation journey, the lar largest circulation journal in the field of CT surgery. Just to give you an idea of our present uh, clinical footprint, in 2020, even with the pandemic, uh, we did just under 6,900 operations at the various sites you see there, making us one of the largest groups in the country. We saw over 7,500 outpatients last year. We have one of the largest lung transplant programs in the country, and I'll talk about that a little bit in my special um, highlight, and also one of the largest surgical heart failure programs in the country. As John mentioned, we're really a national referral center for complex cardiothoracic surgery, including arrhythmia surgery, aortic surgery, lung and heart transplantation, heart failure, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, among others. And we have members of our faculty who have really been pioneers in developing minimally invasive techniques, both in cardiac and thoracic surgery, and we have one of the biggest thoracic robotic programs in the region. In terms of basic and translational research, and I'll spend some time later in this talk Talking about that, we have three NIH-funded basic research programs, the Cardiac Arrhythmia Laboratory, which I run with Dr. Melby, the Transplant Immunology Laboratory, run by Drs. Kreisel and Gelman, and I'll talk about their lab um, a little later, and a lung transplant policy and donor management, uh, recently funded by the NIH Principal PI in our group, Dr. Varun Puri, and his co-investigators, Drs. Yang and Chang. We also have a very active clinical research and data management office. And you know, doing making clinical advances require both doing basic research, but then translating that to clinical practice. In order to do that, you need to run clinical trials. And we're really blessed to have a really talented group of hardworking clinical research and data managers. These are 18 FTEs. In 2020, we had 110 active clinical trials, and they maintain 16 clinical databases, both our own databases locally, but most of, most of these are national and international databases. And this is a little picture of that group from a Zoom call as many of you know, we, like many of you were working remotely, and this is our Zoom call uh, from this week. If you just look at our research highlights, we have um, probably, certainly, if not the best, one of the best funded divisions in the country, and our total extramural research funding was over $6 million in two, 2020. We have one of the longest running um, R01s, which is the major type of investigator grant from the NIH um, that's been going on now for 36 years. Um, I'm PI of that grant, and it's had the same name for 36 years, so we came up with a very good idea a long time ago. And we have one of the largest program project grants in the field of surgery, and the PIs of that are Drs. Kreisel and Gelman. I'll talk a little bit about their research a little later. Um, it's been a very productive group, and for this, we owe a great debt to everyone I've just mentioned. We've, over the last five, five years, averaged 95 peer-reviewed publications, and with a little extra time in our hands in 2020 due to the pandemic, we actually published 146 peer-reviewed papers in the last calendar year. Now, I mentioned also 
that the last part, the last leg of the stool of our tripatriate mission is the uh, training of future leaders in our specialty. We have the actual second oldest training program in the world. Our program director presently is Spencer Melby. And we train three cardiothoracic surgeons a year in our program. And we also train an additional fellow each year in pediatric CT surgery. I would mention, I think it's important to note that of our current residents, over half are women, and that's something we've really been committed to, to increasing the diversity of our specialty. And our clinical fellows now either have held or presently hold leadership positions across North America. And I would just say these are people presently, currently chiefs who we've either had on our faculty or trainees, and presently we've had um, our own are now chiefs at Mass General, Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, University of Rochester, University of Maryland, Northwestern, Emory, University of Louisville, Indiana, Medical College of Georgia, UT Southwestern, University of Cincinnati, University of Nebraska, OHSU, University of Ottawa, University of Illinois, Banner MD Anderson and Medical City of Dallas. So there's actually a couple others we just recently discovered, but these are not the whole history. These are present current chiefs of either sections of cardiac or thoracic surgery or divisions or um, departments of surgery. So you can see we've been extremely committed and I think we've um, overall owe a great deal of debt to the faculty here for training some excellent academic surgeons that are now around the country. And this is becoming ever more important because there's a critical shortage present of trained, of not only trained cardiothoracic surgeons, but also physician scientists. And that's been a primary objective of our division to train these uh, cardiothoracic surgeons and develop them for future leadership. And an integral part of our training is to prepare surgeons to be physician scientists. In, rec in recognition of our commitment to innovation and research, we've been awarded a NIH training grant, which allows funding to train physician scientists in cardiothoracic surgery. Our grant's been funded for 25 years and it is the oldest and largest one in the country. We've trained more physician scientists, over 100, than any other program in the country. But also we've trained 120 foreign fellows from 20 countries in our division, and many have become leaders in their home countries. Now I'd like to get a little bit to the topic tonight after that uh, winded introduction on leading edge medicine in our field. And when we look at leading edge medicine, it's important to remember that the foundation for clinical innovation and progress is really basic and translational research. And we feel strongly that we need to train surgeon scientists to perform this research. The surgeon scientist plays a critical role by identifying clinical problems researching the underlying mechanisms of disease processes, and then using this knowledge to develop improved therapeutics. I'd like to highlight two of our clinical programs in our division that I think exemplify the importance of combining laboratory investigation and clinical excellence. Both of these programs have had enormous impact on the field of CT surgery and are known around the world. I'll start with arrhythmia surgery and then talk about our program in lung transplantation. The Cardiac Arrhythmia Laboratory was founded in 1983 here by Dr. James Cox. He led the program from 1983 to 1996, and I've had the uh, privilege of leading it since 2000. This laboratory I'll describe a little bit has been really committed to trying to understand the mechanisms of arrhythmias and how to treat them surgically. The lab has had only two directors uh, for really 20 years, and that was Drs. John Boineau and Rick Schusler. Dr. Boineau unfortunately passed away several years ago, but Dr. Schusler has led the lab up to the end of this year, retiring at the end of 2020. Dr. Christian Zemlin, you can see his picture um, on the bottom column. He took over the post recently and is making excellent contributions. My own um, interest in arrhythmia surgery really dates back. I was Dr. Cox's first research fellow in, I won't even tell you the year, 1978. But this is a picture of Dr. Cox's lab when he left Duke to come to WashU 
1982. And I'm in this picture, but I doubt anyone will recognize you because the years have not been that kind to me. But that is me. Um, I'm fortunate not to be here, uh, not to have you all here, so I hear the laughter. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been a pretty rough ride here for me, it looks like. But um, I've had the pleasure of really being and doing arrhythmia research really since a third year medical student. Our laboratory could not have done what it's done without the support for the foundation. I'm just I've just listed on this slide the the funds at the foundation, which have supported the cardiac surgery arrhythmia laboratory over the years. I was lucky to be the Schoenberg Endowed Chair for 14 years, and that provided critical support. The Cardiothoracic Surgery Endowment Fund, which really was um, left to us by Dr. Kachukas and his group at Jewish Hospital, provided and still provides excellent startup funds for both our basic and clinical research and for other aspects of our mission. I'd also like to acknowledge the Orthwine Fund. I've talked about the Kachukas Endowed Research Fellowship, as well as the Goldstein Family Foundation gift and their fellowship fund, and the Jeanette and Nathan Sauls Endowed CT Research Fund. We've also been supported by the Wolf Cardiovascular Endowed Fund and the Bernard Memorial Endowment. So you can see it's provided the kind of resources that really are available at very few places around the world. Our work, as I said, is focused on the surgical treatment of cardiac arrhythmias. And these are irregular rhythms of the heart that can be very life-threatening. We began this line of investigation 30 years ago when we realized that drugs have very unpredictable and often undesirable effects. And we needed to understand the mechanisms of arrhythmias to allow us to help cure often these life-threatening rhythm disturbances. A major strength of this laboratory, and I'll show you some of our work, has been that the results of our experimental studies have been rapidly and translated into clinical practice, and that has uh, continued to occur up until this day. We really developed a method that has been now widely accepted of how to approach each arrhythmia by defining first the fundamental substrates and mechanisms in the, in the laboratory, developing surgical treatments, testing them, and then applying them to patients. For almost the last 30 years, we focused on atrial fibrillation, which I look back, it was a, a bit of a tough choice because this is easily the most complex arrhythmia that we know. And there's just some, you can see some little squiggly diagrams of all the different mechanisms that we think and still think to this day are responsible for the, the arrhythmia. So it was certainly a challenge to both understand that and develop then some intervention to cure it. Why, why is AFib even a problem? And that's, uh, like I said, it's the most common arrhythmia in the world. And its incidence is increasing dramatically, uh, principally due to the aging population. But it's estimated to affect over 25 million Americans and expected to increase to 50 million by 2050. AFib can be really uncomfortable. It can cause shortness of breath and palpitations, but most importantly, it increases your risk of stroke by five to six times. And every study has shown that if you have AFib, you have a poorer late survival. The opportunity here was drug therapy, antiarrhythmic drugs in particular, have been shown to be ineffective in most patients. So the surgeon um, scientist, Dr. Cox at that time, identified the problem and then went about trying to understand the mechanism. And this was done here at WashU, where we took a number of patients going for cardiac surgery and mapped um, the type of arrhythmias that were causing AFib and trying to understand how they both started and were maintained and then how we could stop them. That led to the development, as you can see on the cartoon, on your right of the maze procedure. This was a series of incisions in both the left and right atrium that we thought would pretty much stop every type of atrial fibrillation. And it, it actually turned out to be, um, to stand the test of time with that. After coming up with a theoretical way to stop what we thought were the mechanisms of AFib, we then performed these uh, procedures in three animal models and found 
these were animal models where we induced AFib in animals and then found that the operation was uniformly effective in curing or ending atrial fib. And the first human operation, the first human maze procedure was performed in 1987 at Barnes Hospital. It's hard to minimize the magnitude of that achievement, which really came right out of the research laboratories here. The maze procedure was the first successful interventional procedure for atrial fibrillation, which at the time was felt to be a chaotic rhythm that really there was not gonna be a good surgical treatment for. It set the stage for the development of catheter ablation for AFib, which has become very, very common. And it, ended, it, it developed an entire new area of cardiac surgery. Now, while this operation was very efficacious and our late success with it was 80%, even at 10 years, it was very rarely performed due to its complexity. So it shows you that sometimes innovation alone is not enough, that you need to continue to innovate to try to get to something that can be widely performed with very little risk by most surgeons. So clinical progress, I always say, occurs through a continuous process of challenging the status quo. One frustrating thing is you never quite get to the end of the line, but that's also the challenging thing that keeps us all going. More recently, we took this complex operation and in the laboratory developed first ablation tools to replace those incisions and then minimally invasive techniques that ended in the procedure shown below, which we call the Cox Maze 4 procedure, the fourth version of it. That operation we introduced in 2002, it's become the gold standard for the treatment of AFib all over the world. And its success rate has been just as good as the really complex uh, cut and sew operation I showed with 80% of patients still free from arrhythmia at 10 years. This, this fourth version is the only surgical procedure ever to have received an indication to treat AFib from the FDA, and it remains the only procedure because it's the only one that really a lot of surgeons can do without much risk and that has excellent results. And again, that came from a stepwise progression from working out both the type of devices to use and the type of patients to treat in the laboratory and then bringing that to the operating room. And that's one of the great advantages that we have as surgeon scientists. We then developed minimally invasive techniques and ablation devices and brought them to the operating room. And this is a patient that had a maze and we used to have to divide the entire breastbone, but now can do the procedure through a two and a half incision on the side. And we don't use rib spreading and just use a scope for guidance. We found that this less invasive technique had dramatically reduced morbidity and hospital stay in our patients. We've also shown that this procedure now um, now that we have more experience, can improve not only gets rid of AFib and prevent stroke, but it does improve late survival in patients. And in patients with AFib, um, if you have a maze procedure, you have about a 20% better survival at 10 years than those patients who did not have a maze procedure. And I'd like to end with one, um, one little vignette to show that innovation really never stops. Now, after getting the maze four, you think, okay, things are pretty good. But we did notice that these um, ablation devices weren't working as well in humans as they seem to work in the animal models. They work fantastic in animals. But in humans, we noticed when we check these lines of ablation, which block electrical activity, that sometimes they didn't block electrical activity. And this took us you know, over a decade, maybe we weren't so uh, smart, but it took us a decade to try to figure out this problem. But these are these bipolar clamps. You clamp the tissue and then pass radio frequency energy in between the jaws. It's like a bit of a branding device, extremely effective in animals, but we couldn't understand why it failed sometimes in people. Well, this is another advantage of working here at Wash U. We work with our partners at uh, Mid-America transplant, and in the hearts that were turned down for heart transplant that were donated, we performed maze procedures with this clamp. And um, we published just this, uh, just a few months ago, our results with this. And we were able to develop, one, we were able to find the problem and develop a very easy solution to that problem. And you can see this is a, a piece of heart. Blue is the 
uh, red is the normal muscle and white is the scar. We want scar to go all the way through. And you can see it didn't on the first panel, but did on the second with a very simple technique we developed within, within a couple weeks of publishing this article, it changed practice all over the world. So I think you can see the impact you can have both by constantly asking questions, never quite being satisfied and being able to go to the lab. It's one of the great advantages we have here at WashU and answer that. Just to summarize now and um, about the arrhythmia laboratories, the findings really developed uh, an entirely new field of cardiac surgery. And we've restored heart rhythm, not only thousands of patients in St. Louis in our region, but around the nation and world. It's estimated that last year, over 50,000 maze procedures were performed worldwide. This was compared to less than um, 400 worldwide when we introduced the maze four. Our group has trained surgeons around the world on these procedures. And just in the last 10 years, we've published over 100 articles on AFib. So I think you can see what can be done with the support we've had and the commitment to using uh, basic and translational research to improve clinical care. Another great example of exactly that is the Transplant Immunology Laboratory. And I'd like to turn to that now. This has been led since 2006 when it was founded by Drs. Dan Kreisel and Dr. Andrew Gelman, shown in the pictures below. And it's really one of the best funded and most productive surgical research laboratories in the US. And um, both of them deserve a great deal of credit. This is their lab members. You can see they've got quite a group um, of both uh, faculty and staff scientists and fellows and, and staff that help support all their superb work. And this is a list, you know, when you to list their current funding, I had to go to two slides, which is something we all wish we had to do. And this is their extramural funding. And obviously, they're extremely well funded by the NIH. And I mentioned their program project grant, but also by the VA and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation but also from our own Institute of Clinical Translational Sciences, and also from the Barnes Jewish Foundation. Uh, Dr. Kreisel holds the Patterson Mid-America Distinguished Endowed Chair, Dr. Gelman, the Merits Endowed Chair for Immunology and Oncology. They've also received funding from the Merits Lung Center Fund, the Sizic Lung Transplant Fund, and the Cardiothoracic Surgery Fund. Now they have a broad area of interest, but mainly focused on lung and heart transplantation, mitochondrial dysfunction, and also inflammation in general. But I'd like to really focus on their work in lung transplantation and how that has also um, dovetailed extremely nicely with the world-class clinical program that we have here in lung transplantation at WashU. And this is another area where our, both our research and clinical expertise has had a very storied tradition. Dr. Cooper, our division chief from 1997 to 2005, performed the first single lung transplantation in the world. And Dr. Patterson, our division chief from 2005 to 2014, performed the first double lung transplant. You can see with their leadership in over 15 years really provided a lot of the foundation for the great achievements of our division. Um, because of their efforts and that of uh, our other faculty and fellows, we've been recognized as a world leader in the field of lung transplantation over this time. Since 2014, this program has been led by Dr. Kreisel. And as I said, he holds the Patterson MTS Distinguished Chair. And that's a picture of Dr. Patterson and Dr. Kreisel at his induction ceremony. Under Dr. Kreisel's leadership since 2014, and you can see on this graph the number of lung transplants we do a year, we've increased in size to one of the largest programs in the country. But just doing a lot of surgery is not really our goal. Um, in order to advance the field and improve the care of their patients, this has to be combined with an active laboratory. And that requires first identifying the problem. And for all of us, um, for those in the field, the problem is that lung transplantation has a relatively poor long-term survival, primarily due to organ rejection. And this is a paper, this is a graph from a paper looking at overall survival 
of our experience with 1,500 lung transplant patients, which we published in 2018. And you can see that the 10-year survival in these patients is less than 50%. And recently, this is a graph of median survival after lung transplantation from the um, UNOS database from 2019. And you can see the median survival for an adult after lung transplantation is 6.2 years and only 5.7 years for children. So you can see, while this is a great clinical advance, we can and need to do better. And as I said before, basic and translational research is really the foundation for this clinical innovation and, and progress. And I can think of no two better scientists than Dr. Gelman and Dr. Kreisel in both identifying clinical problems and researching underlying mechanisms and developing therapeutics. And I'll show you some of their more recent work in the next few slides. But what they've really focused on is trying to understand rejection, the mechanism of rejection, and of tolerance. And tolerance is where your body will become tolerant to the um, donor tissue. And trying to understand that and also developing therapeutics that can help both minimize rejection and improve tolerance. And I'll just show you some of their just um, uh, what's been an incredible amount of very productive and impactful work from their laboratory. And this is a, a and all of which in very, very, um, very high impact journals in the field. This is a paper in 2018 from JCI in which they described a mechanism that promotes, the mechanism that promotes primary graft dysfunction and does suggest some therapeutics that may be able to be used to prevent that. This is another article from the next year, also in JCI, in which they described um, for the first time a mouse model of antibody-mediated rejection. And developing animal models is really important because as I said, um, and we spend a lot of time in the research lab trying to do that because where we need to work out both mechanisms and therapeutics needs to be in animals before we can take it safely into the operating room. And this is a, a, a model that hopefully will help um, define the mechanisms and also develop uh, therapeutics. And already they've come a long way in trying to understand some of the mechanisms that triggers this antibody mediated rejection, which is an often fatal complication after lung transplant. Um, here's another uh, work from 2020 from uh, Dr. Gelman and Kreisel describing the mechanisms mediating lung transplant tolerance in the American Journal of Transplantation. And, and, and finally, this is another article, again from last year, all JCI, uh, looking at description of mechanisms mediating lung transplant tolerance. And again, um, in a very impactful study in a very high impact journal. But while they've already been incredibly productive at helping to find mechanisms and, and suggesting new therapeutics, They've also had some broad interests that even go beyond lung transplant. In this article um, published by Dr. Kreisel in collaboration with Corey Levine, one of our cardiologists, they really described a new mechanism of cell death after heart transplantation, a new pathway. And I think this really is an important paper that's gonna end up having uh, a really major clinical impact. And finally, Dr. Gelman, uh, with some help from um, our intramural funding, has also turned his interest in inflammation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this article also that's in press preview of JCI Insight into circulating mitochondrial DNA is an indicator of severe illness and more mortality from COVID-19 may suggest an easy blood test that could tell you if you're really at risk for having a very uh, bad course with COVID, which I think we all realize is something we really could use. As Judah Folkman, one of the great surgeon scientists says, science goes where you imagine it to go. 
And if you have a great intellect and a great imagination, which I think does epitomize both doctors Kreisel and Gelman, it can go a lot of places. And I hope to give you an idea of their um, real productivity. So with those two examples of what we've been able to do, both with our tripartite mission and with the support of the foundation, I'd like to conclude. And I'd like to just say that over the last 90 years, our division, I think, has been successful in providing world-class patient care, performing innovative and groundbreaking research, and training the next generation of surgical leaders. I think our commitment to basic translational and clinical research has generated numerous clinical advances, and I've given you just a couple examples, and improved the care of patients, not just in our region, but around the world. Now, none of this would have been possible, and I've mentioned only a few people without a really talented faculty that we're blessed to have and a devoted and skilled team of support staff, nurses, and fellows. And finally, on behalf of our whole division, um, we're extremely grateful to the foundation and all the philanthropists for their support over the years in helping us to continually improve patient care and advance the field of cardiothoracic surgery. Thank you very much for your support on behalf of all of us, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Damiano. That was a wonderful presentation. We do have a few questions coming in. So let's start off with, we see the funding you receive from the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital has received great outcomes. What can other funding provide? Well, I mean, we have a continual need for that um, as we're doing it. We have had great outcomes and we're very um, we're very grateful for all this philanthropy over the years, which really stretches back um, decades. Um, and it has provided us an infrastructure that is really unique in this country. Um, as many of you know, the, the amount of what, the money that we generate from clinical practice, has decreased as the reimbursements for our care have decreased. And we're really dependent on both grant funding from the NIH and philanthropy for achieving many of the other parts of our mission, in particularly in basic translational and clinical research and in training physician scientists. And that is, both of those are very important. Um, I think we're in, there's a great need for further philanthropy, particularly in a couple areas. We are presently having a real shortage of funds for physician scientists, um, the training of physician scientists, particularly in clinical fields. The NIH is much more interested right now in training basic scientists, but I'd hope to show you what the advantage of having surgeon scientists too, because we provide a perspective and we're intimately available, uh, we're intimately involved with patients on a daily basis and see these problems develop and, and I think can provide a great perspective for the direction of research. And that is an area that we're really in need of and I would like to thank some of the generous recent gifts for that area where we really um, are hoping to continue to be able to carry out that part of our mission. The other thing that is really while we do have, you know, some of the, uh, you know, we do have one of the highest amounts of NIH and other VA and other extramural funding from grant sources, that does not at all cover our costs of doing research. So we're continually in need of that. Um, the supporting of, of a laboratory of even talented investigators usually requires millions of dollars to get to the point of getting NIH funding. And we've been very, very fortunate here to be both, both support the basic research, which you can eventually get NIH funding, but a lot of the clinical research we carry out totally with uh, support we receive from foundation and occasionally from some industry sources, but that still is a big need. Finally, we're hoping uh, to build, we're in the midst of putting up a new tower, a heart and vascular tower that uh, John has been really, John Lynch has been spearheading also, and we really could use um, philanthropic dollars to really help create a world-class uh, heart and vascular institute here. Um, and 
um, I think to support the uh, incredibly talented faculty in uh, cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology, and vascular surgery. Excellent. Thank you. What does the future of heart surgery look like? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think, you know, we, we're a division of cardiothoracic surgery, so I'll probably broaden you into the whole, what's the future of cardiothoracic surgery? Um, you know, I think, you know, one of our big goals has been um, in the development of less invasive techniques, particularly in both cardiac and thoracic surgery. You know, both, uh, both specialties have done very complex surgery, often through fairly large incisions. With cardiac patients, we need the heart-lung machine, and traditionally went through a, a sternotomy where your whole breastbone got split. And I think you're going to see further development in the next decade of minimally invasive techniques. So whether we're seeing that, and we have a big program in percutaneous valve treatments and minimally invasive, uh, some of which many of which do not need the cardiopulmonary bypass, and also trying to further um, minimize the amount of trauma when we have to do open surgery. Our thoracic group have been pioneers in robotic surgery and also in uh, video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, and I think that's another area you're going to see. Finally, from I think you're going to see a much more um, mechanistically, I guess, guided uh, therapy. Um, this will hopefully, you can see some of the work that Dr. Kreisel, as we try to understand rejection and how it's different in every patient, that we can understand those mechanisms and develop improved therapeutics. And I think you're going to see uh, a lot of that. We still, one of the big areas which we don't understand is the inflammatory response to surgery with Dr. Melby is looking at that. That appears to be what causes postoperative AFib, but it results in a lot of problems, including organ rejection and other problems that we can um, need to understand that mechanism. I think uh, the improved understanding of inflammation is going to really improve our therapeutics um, in the field. And finally, what cardiothoracic surgery is going to look like in the future we will all hope will be a much more uh, diverse group. We're really committed. As I said, over half our trainees are um, women right now. We've also about a, th a, 30, a third of our trainees have been uh, both underrepresented minorities or women over the last uh, four to five years. So we're really hoping that the future of cardiothoracic surgery is also going to look like a much more diverse specialty, which I think is really critical for our future. Thank you very much. You spoke a little bit about the COVID-19 pandemic. How did you manage during this? And are you now operating at the same level as before? <laughs> now, that, that is an excellent question with the pandemic. Um, you know, it's been the most, I, I'll probably count, uh, talk for myself and probably most of our faculty, probably one of the most difficult times of, of my professional and everyone's professional careers. Um, we initially, in March and April, uh, stopped all elective surgery as we tried to feel our way through this pandemic. Um, I really have to really give a huge amount of credit to all of our staff, um, our nurses who have managed and continue to manage a year later with a lot of, we've had to move a lot of our workforce to remote, which we never thought was even possible. And now uh, we're all getting used to remote Zoom meetings and trying to minimize people in the office. And that has continued to this day. We did restart uh, both our cardiothoracic, cardiac and thoracic elective schedules near mid-April and May, and, and actually had quite a busy summer. Much different. All our patients are COVID tested. Um, we all wear, of course, as surgeons, we wear masks all the time, but we wear masks now everywhere. Um, and um, you know, maintaining social distance. But I'm happy to say that with a great effort from our office staff and others, we've really been able to do that very safely. Uh, while we've had a number of our faculty and fellows and some staff get COVID, um, we've really had very minimal, if, if hardly any, um, hospital um, spread of the disease. And, and we've been very lucky that no one 
has um, had a really bad case of it. Uh, but it's been very challenging, both first shutting down, then getting going. I would say that we we had a we had the, the the calendar year very busy, but this last spike of COVID in November December, which was much worse than we saw in the spring, has sort of decreased our volumes probably for in January maybe in about ten percent. So we're busy, but not quite where we were. But we're looking to get back to normal volumes over the next few months after we've <laughs> hopefully. We've all, all, virtually all of our staff and, and faculty are vaccinated. Hopefully we'll have, and most of the hospital is, hopefully with most of the community we can get back. But it's a challenge. Um, and, and it resulted, I would have to say, in a, a long period where all of our basic research laboratories were, were stopped. I would have to say, you know, Dr. Gelman and his group really has, have done some excellent work in COVID. Thank you. We'll take one or two more questions. We do have one here. Are you able to speak to any TAVR updates and maintenance for those long term? Well, updates, that is a field that continues to evolve. And, um, you know, right now, uh, trancast, trancast, transcatheter aortic valve technology is really and techniques have really improved to the point that that really is the treatment both for um, um, not only high risk patients, but for many low risk patients now. We, we are still evolving the transcatheter approaches to the mitral valve, but we do have a number of therapeutics um, like the mitral clip and then some transcatheter mitral replacements that um, not quite where aortic valve replacement is, but getting there. And I think you'll see some huge improvements over the next decade. And that's another big area of where I say we're moving toward a much less invasive field of CT surgery. Um, we've, we recently did the third tricuspid valve replacement in the world here in our group led by Dr. Zaharias, who's a cardiologist, and Dr. Maniars, who runs on the surgical side, the director of our, ta our transcatheter program. So it's really starting to impact all the valves. And I'll I think you'll see some major advances. For those who ask about, I'm not sure they were getting to durability, but the durability of the transcatheter aortic valves, which are the only ones that have been put in, in any numbers, appears to be very good. And um, probably, a, at least at this point, still pretty equivalent to the surgical valves we used to put in. Thank you. All right, our last question will be, can you give us an idea of your top three to five most frequently performed procedures? Oh, for me personally, yes. Well, three to five, that would be very good. Um, yes, I could do that exactly. Coronary bypass grafting, um, which is interesting because, you know, 20 years ago, I'd say that was by far my most common, but probably would be fourth or fifth on the list right now. Aortic valve replacement was very common um, 10 years ago and is less common because of transcatheter techniques and mainly is... Uh, done in younger patients or patients who aren't candidates for transcatheter therapeutics. Um, I, we've developed a big referral center for septal myectomy um, for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So that would probably be, um, and I'm going in probably increasing frequency, um, that would probably be the third most common procedure. But we really, we have a really fantastic team. And one of the things, and Again, to thank um, all the clinical chairs and John Lynch for providing this type of an environment. But we have fantastic collaborators in both radiology and cardiology, which have led us to be designated a center of excellence for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, next would be the maze, which I talked about. And we do a lot of maze, which is the group does. I do a lot personally, uh, both for people just with AFib, but also in with other cardiac surgery. But probably the most common procedure is minimally invasive mitral surgery with or without tricuspid valve surgery. And, you know, that that is a really common problem. And the transcatheter therapeutics haven't really gotten up to the point. But we've been able to, we're, we're really working to try to develop surgery that becomes, um, certainly doesn't have a, any much more morbidity than a transcatheter approach. And I think we're making progress. 
Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for submitting the questions. Dr. Damiano, do you have any closing remarks? No. Again, just uh, first, um, thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank Susan and everyone at the foundation for inviting me this evening, to thank John and everyone at BJH and BJC for their support, um, to thank uh, my faculty, who is amazing. Hope I gave you a little uh, idea of that and all of our support staff and nurses. But finally, to thank the foundation. I really can't emphasize enough that without um, the support we've had by the foundation, both to start our new investigators to support our labs, uh, particularly in, in both getting, until they get NIH funding, but even with NIH funding, it doesn't come close to covering our expenses, and also providing all the support for the clinical research, which really helps make, helps translate a lot of these uh, basic findings into reality. And without the support we've had from that, we really um, couldn't have achieved that. So I'd like to close with a, a big thank you to everyone and the philanthropy. It's been uh, very, very gratifying. And I hope I've given you some idea of the impact it's had, not only here in St. Louis, but around the world. Thank you for all your questions. I'm Dick Miles, Chairman of the Board for the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our first virtual Leading Edge Medicine event, and there'll be more this year. Thank you, Dr. Damiano, for your insightful presentation on the life-saving work being done in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery related to lung transplant and heart disease. Dr. Damiano's advances in the area of cardiothoracic surgery are just a few examples of the impact philanthropy can have. Your gifts really do move the needle and change the lives of our patients, our community, and the world. As the chairman of the board for the Foundation for Barnes Jewish Hospital, I thank you all. Please consider sharing something you learned tonight with your friends and family. Tell them about our event or share the video of this virtual event. The recording will be posted to the Foundation's website and Facebook page soon. We also invite all of you to attend our other virtual events this year. You will find all specific information about the dates and topics on the Foundation's website, foundationbarnesjewish.org, under the heading Events. Thank you for your time and attention this evening. Good night.